So as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm Canadian. And back home, where I'm from in Toronto, there's a cafe that's opened up called Snakes and Lattes. Now, Snakes and Lattes is really interesting because they don't have Wi-Fi and they have a limited menu. But they're so popular that if you want to go there on a Friday or Saturday night, you need two to three week reservations. And in fact, to keep up with demand, they've had to expand twice. First into the basement and then into the, the uh, store next door. So what's so exciting and special about Snakes and Lattes? Might surprise you. Snakes and Lattes is a board game cafe. So people, customers pay $5 to play one of the 2,500 games that line the cafe's walls. So Snakes and Lattes is part of a growing trend. Last year in the US, hobby game sales went up by 25%. Those are games that people play around the table, board games, card games, or other kind of role-playing games. Well, at the same time, video game sales went down by 38%. And I think that's what this speaks to is a growing interest in turning away from the screen and turning towards each other and to the world around us. We're remembering the kinds of games we played before video games and we're remembering how much fun it is to sit with friends and family around a uh, table and spend an afternoon playing games together. Now, what I want to talk about today and this, what I think is really important about this is that what we're not turning away from is games. Because games are really important, and games are really um, effective at fostering community, at building connections between ourselves and the world, and other people, and they're amazing ways to learn and to teach in new ways. And they're also incredible platforms for spreading joy, empathy, and compassion. So part of, as part of this growing trend of retro gaming, as it's being called, there's a growing group of people who are combining old games and the old ways we used to play with the new technologies of today. And they're creating new ways to play. And in these new ways to play, the world becomes a game board and the players become characters in the game. So you may be thinking, how does this work? What do these games look like? When I tell people I'm a game designer, people tend to think I design video games. Obviously I don't. Um, and I found that the best way to kind of convey to people what kind of games I create is by way of example. And my favorite example is a game that I worked on called Gentrification the Game. <laughs> Gentrification the Game uses whimsy, kindness, and a dash of the absurd to get people out in their neighborhoods talking to each other and engaging with public space. So the gameplay basically revolves, it's basically a live action board game. It's a game that revolves around the struggle between a team of locals who are trying to maintain the neighborhood space as it is, and a team of developers who are trying to gentrify the neighborhood. And so what happens is people run around the neighborhood collecting um, properties as you would in Monopoly, and then the progress of the game is tracked around this giant, satisfyingly analog, chalk-based map. And what people loved most about this game, and what I love most about this game, is that to get a power-up in this game, you actually have to go and do something in real life. Something crazy and absurd. So, if you're on the local team and you want to stage a protest against the developers, you actually have to go out into the streets and engage in a real protest with crazy signs that say absurdist happy things. At the same time, if you're on the developer team, if you want to stage a PR campaign, you have to go around and give flowers to people. So these kind of random acts of unexpected kindness bring people who are not playing the game into the game. And they serve as, in this way, the gameplay becomes a platform for something greater. It becomes a way for people, for players, to move beyond just simply talking about change to actually being the change. And this game was so compelling to people that we ended up running it in neighborhoods and streets in Berlin, Toronto, and New York. And I think the reason that this game was so compelling to people and so kind of really struck a chord with people is that it, it speaks to the, the element of games which I think are naturally conducive to bringing people together and giving them hope and positivity and optimism about changing the world. And this is really important because we can become so bogged down with all of the problems in the world that can kind of make us feel that we're, um, that we're, we're without hope, there's nothing we can do. 
And the importance of this was really struck home to me recently when I became involved with a local group called Living Smart, which is basically a self-help group for helping people to live sustainably in their everyday lives. And they are incredibly effective at getting people to change and getting people to make small changes that inevitably make bigger changes down the road. And the reason that they're so effective is that instead of focusing on, again, the negative and the, po the problems of the world, they focus on small things that people can, people can do. They focus on optimism, on rewards, and celebration. And so this focus on hope and positivity, I think, also speaks to and explains um, another thing we noticed in gentrification, which was that at the end of the game, players would naturally start talking to each other about the issues. They would talk and compare the difference between what had happened in the game and what was happening in their neighborhoods in real life. And so they're getting engaged in this way that I think is incredible because we weren't, you know, we weren't kind of encouraging them to do that. They were doing it by themselves. And so I think this kind of subtle, gentle support of getting people engaged rather than beating people over the head, of it, head with it as we sometimes do when we're trying to get people engaged in issues really, really works and is really kind of an important thing you can do with games. So, gentrification is just one of a growing movement of these kind of unconventional games. Sometimes they're called pervasive games, or big games, or urban games. And they're created by people all around the world who just are kind of doing it for the love, the love of games, bringing a smile to people's faces, wanting to tell people about issues. And they're usually done as kind of a gift to a community or, or people's friends. And they're done usually for free. So all of the games that I've done have been for free for people to play. And that's usually the case with the, the, the movement as a whole. So this is a game called Groove Move that was done in New York City in Times Square. And it was part of a games festival that happens every year there called Come Out and Play. And the object of this game was to just dance across the street, getting as many kind of innocent bystanders as you could dancing across the street with you. And that was how you got points. This is another game that was part of the same festival called uh, Subway Mafia. So if anybody's played that game as a kid where you kind of kill people by blinking at them, it was that game but done on a subway car. And it just kind of took the game to a whole other level. And it was just really, really fun. <laughs> Games can also take place as part of public or culture festivals. So this is just a simply a huge game of Scrabble that was done as part of Pedestrian Sundays in Kensington Market in Toronto. This is another game from Toronto that recently finished, um, it's called ZTO, and it was this multi-month, huge kind of immersive theatrical experience that you could engage with over different kind of media platforms. And then on the last weekend of the game, um, there was this retreat where this interactive theater happened, and it was this very immersive, compelling, interesting story that kind of unfolded for players who went to this retreat. And then games can also be, uh, these games can also be a cross between board games and theatrical experiences. This was a game I played called The Agency as part of a festival in London called Hide and Seek and that happens every year as well. This is also part of Hide and Seek. Um, it's showing kind of how games can be used to teach. So this was a game called Taunt and it was basically teaching through random crazy insults the, the linguistic origins of the English language and it was also a really, really fun game to play. This was a game that I worked on earlier this year with a group of kids as co-creators. And we created a privacy literacy game for kids to learn about privacy. And what was so inspiring to me is that these kids didn't have this idea yet that games were hard to create, which is kind of this idea I think we have in society, that games are hard to create. And so in their minds, they were game designers and they were gonna make something awesome. And we did, we made this game called The Watchers. It's a video game board game hybrid that you play on your iPad and on, on the board around the table with other people. And as you can see from all of the games I've talked about, they're all very low tech or no tech, and they're low budget, and basically anybody can do them. And I never, before making these games, had any training in game design. I just started doing it because I wanted to do it. The point that I want to leave you with is that the, the inter social media and the internet have, have made it so that we can self-publish things really easily. They've made the entry barrier so low. So people are publishing books, they're making videos, and they're, um, they're publishing their own music. But we haven't really got that far with games yet. And I think it's about time. And I think we can do this. And this is something I'd really like to see. Thank you.